We're going to talk about the hypothalamus today. I realize this is not in the spinal cord, but it does communicate with the spinal cord. Uh, it does have direct connections with the autonomic neurons we talked about last time. And they're reciprocal. So it has an idea of what's going on in the autonomic nervous system, and it can control what goes on in the autonomic nervous system. To help regulate a variety of behaviors. Those behaviors could be a general stress response. Uh, it could be seeking out water or, or food. Uh, clearly, the hypothalamus can regulate feeding behaviors. Uh, we can see that right here. On the left, we have a leptin knockout mouse. You can see it's slightly larger than its wild-type counterpart over here. And that's because leptin inhibits feeding behaviors. When they lack the ability to produce leptin, they don't get the feedback that they're starting to store fatty tissue because of overconsumption, and they continue to eat and eat and eat. That's so they get a little bit bigger. Uh, for the most part, the hypothalamus is going to cause dramatic changes in our body by communicating with the pituitary. The pituitary is then going to release hormones and cause some major effect. It could be short-lived, like a stress response, or it could be long-lived, like sexual development. Uh, there's a few reflexes that our uh, hypothalamus is going to regulate. Sort of long-lived reflexes, not like a stretch reflex or anything, but when your blood osmolarity gets a little too high, for example, you feel thirsty. You drink enough. You drop your salt content, you don't feel thirsty. Same thing with hunger. You have an empty stomach, that creates the sensation of hunger. Your hypothalamus helps coordinate your behavior so you go seek out food. And when you eat it, you feel good about it. It helps with that too. So even though it's a very small area, it's well connected. And that's really what life's about. Um, connections, it's who you know. <coughs> Uh, the hypothalamus and the pituitary form um, a wonderful partnership. So they, they act together to regulate bodily functions through the release of hormones. And these are just long distance neurotransmitters, really. Rather than just acting on neurons, they're going to act on tissues throughout the body. Uh, we should be able to locate the hypothalamus. two major landmarks to think about. Uh, the first would be your optic chiasm. So this is where the optic nerves converge. That marks the anterior boundary of your hypothalamus. The posterior boundary is going to be denoted by our mammillary bodies. So between here and here, we have our hypothalamus. Uh, right in that region, and if we zoom in a bit, we can see it a bit better. Uh, this little nub here would be the infundibulum, that uh, stalk that connects with the pituitary. So the pituitary has been removed here, so we have a better look at the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus lies just below the thalamus, hence the name hypothalamus, just above the pituitary, behind the optic chiasm, and the mammillary bodies would be the posterior nuclei there. So here we have a cross section. We should be able to tell which way uh, this head would be facing. So facing right or facing left? You see some rights, I hear left. Here's your optic eyes and here's your mammalian bodies, anterior and posterior, so facing that way. The hypothalamus contains a bunch of different nuclei, many collections of cells that are, in some cases, sharing similar functions, like our fluid and salt balance, for example, is shared here. That's similar to feeding. It's a little distinct, though. In other cases, they have unique functions. So there's some overlap, but each nucleus is going to have a slightly different effect on our behavior. The major ones to point out, because they'll be coming up again, would be those here. Your paraventricular nucleus is a very important uh, collection of cells in the hypothalamus. Uh, these have direct connections with our autonomic nervous system. So this ties in with the last lecture. These are important central regulators of autonomic function. They're also going to release hormones either into the portal capillary vasculature down here at the median eminence or directly into our peripheral circulation. 
Same thing for the super optic nucleus. These are both going to regulate our, our thirst behaviors. The PVN is more important for stress responses, and the super optic nucleus is a little more important for the release of milk in babies. Um, the arcuate nucleus is an important regulator of feeding behaviors. It's going to get input from a few other hypothalamic regions. The lateral uh, nuclei are going to be our feeding center, and the satiety center will be the ventral medial nuclei. More on these at the end of the lecture. And the suprachiasmatic nucleus, as its name suggests, is just above the optic chiasm. This is an important regulator of circadian rhythms. <coughs> it makes sense that it's located right here where our optic nerves are converging because it receives input from the retina. So it has an idea of how light is it, is it day or is it night? And this will help entrain our circadian rhythms so that in case we change time zones and we need to shift our subjective day at night, an hour or two, we can do that. As these axon tracks running here, some of them will make a pit stop in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The hypothalamus is well connected. It's connected to higher structures, those that are, are, are creating our perceptions, our plans, our emotions, storing memories. And it's also connected to so-called lower structures. Those in the brain stem and spinal cord that are going to regulate autonomic behavior. So here we're looking at some of the higher connections. Uh, we'll hear about certainly the amygdala and the campus later on when we talk about the limbic system. But both of these are going to provide input to the hypothalamus. Here's our hypothalamus. The hippocampus is going to tell us Memories, location, so we can orient ourselves in space, and time as well. The hippocampus helps denote time uh, for events so we can order things. So this tells us about our past, uh, our, our present state of emotions. We'll have an idea of that because of an input from the amygdala here. This is going to project uh, along the scria terminalis, which is pretty similar to the fornix. They both kind of wrap around here. And we also have some idea about the future, what we're planning because of input from the frontal lobes, the basal forebrain there. Those provide input to the hypothalamus. So it has an idea of the past, present, and future. And it can use that to then coordinate our behaviors because there are those lower connections. And these are all reciprocal, input and output. So we have afferents coming into the hypothalamus from our autonomic afferents, and then we have output to control our autonomic efferents. So the output of the parasympathetic and sympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system are controlled in part by the hypothalamus. So if we're feeling uh, <coughs> worried or scared, that emotion can have an effect on our heart rate. The heart can start to race, and that's because your hypothalamus provides direct input to the preganglionic autonomic neurons. In this case, the sympathetic branch to increase heart rate. They're going to dump out norepinephrine there, your sinoatrial node, increases HCN current, faster pacemaking. When we're relaxed, we can start to recruit the parasympathetic branches as well. Those can decrease our heart rate. So this is how our emotions can affect our body and create the actual feeling of those emotions. It's because our hypothalamus is well connected. It knows how we feel and it helps us feel how we feel by affecting the body. Now aside from those axonal projections and your typical synaptic communication that we've covered so far in this class, the hypothalamus is a little unique because it contains endocrine cells. Neuroendocrine, neuroendocrine cells. These are neurons that are going to release hormones into the blood supply. So they're not forming those proximal synapses and releasing neurotransmitter right at their target site. They're going to put it into the vasculature and let it be carried away to communicate over long distances. For the most part, we're talking about peptides here. 
And of course, when we're talking about peptide release, these are going to be in dense core vesicles. So here's your uh, prototypical hypothalamic neuron. <coughs> so we're going to project downward to some sort of vasculature. This might be in the median eminence to communicate with the anterior pituitary, or it could be down in the posterior pituitary to communicate directly with the rest of the body. It depends on what we're talking about. If it's a magnocellular neuron, magno just means big, so they have a big cell body. Those project through the infundibulum down to the posterior pituitary, the neural hypothesis. The adenal hypothesis is going to be the anterior pituitary. That's not going to actually have nervous tissue. Those are just tropes. Those are cells that will release hormones. In the posterior pituitary, that's a collection of axons from magnocellular neurons. And you're going to find those in your paraventricular nucleus and your supraoptic nucleus. Every other nuclei, every other nucleus, including these two, contain parvocellular neurons. So if this is a parvocellular neuron here, this would be the portal uh, capillary vasculature up in the median eminence. So what this ends up looking like, you have a bunch of presynaptic terminals here, 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 and you'll notice, I hope, that these vesicles are a little bit larger and they have a dense core. Electron dense, they're dark. They have kind of a bullseye in the middle. That bullseye would be peptides. Your typical synaptic vesicles don't have that dense core because they're filled with small molecules. They don't absorb the electrons in an electron micrograph the same, so they don't have a dense core. You can tell these are filled with peptides, though, because they have the bullseye. Have a look at these. When these get released, they can enter the nearby capillaries. These capillaries don't have a tight blood-brain barrier, and that allows the peptides to enter them. <clears throat> there are some places where we have a leaky blood-brain barrier. Those are going to serve to allow the exit of hormone, but also the monitoring of blood. We'll get to that in a bit. Once the hormone enters our bloodstream, then it can affect other areas. If we're up here in the median eminence, this is a very local path from the hypothalamus down our infundibulum into the anterior pituitary. There it's going to affect endocrine cells, tropes in other words, that are going to release a different hormone into peripheral circulation. In the neural hypothesis, so in that posterior pituitary, here the axons of those magnocellular neurons are going to project directly into the vasculature there so that they can enter peripheral circulation through that cabinet sinus. So there's no, no endocrine middleman here. The neuron is the endocrine cell in this case. For the small parvocellular neurons, they're going to release hormone into the portal capillary vasculature, this won't affect the rest of the body. It will only affect the endocrine cells in that anterior pituitary. They release a different hormone that affects the rest of the body. This short tract here would be our portal capillary vasculature. It goes from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. Those tropes then respond to some, to some type of hormone and release a different hormone. So we're just changing hormones. And there's a bunch of different hormones that, that are going to be released from the hypothalamus and then the pituitary. Their names generally make sense. Corticotropin releasing hormone. This is the hormone released in the hypothalamus and the median eminence. It will travel down to the anterior pituitary and stimulate the release of adrenal corticotropic hormone. So this is a hormone that causes a release of corticotropins. That would be our adrenal corticotropic hormone. This travels throughout the body and affects some target tissue, being the adrenal gland. It's going to stimulate the release of norepinephrine, epinephrine, we get a fast stress response. And then we have a slower, more long-lived stress response that will somewhat undo what these do uh, through the release of corticosteroids. These are hormones that then affect the rest of the body. 
So you just have a cascade of hormones in these pathways. This is for the stress response. If we're talking about growth, growth hormone releasing hormone. This is the hormone that causes the release of growth hormone. So here's our hypothalamic and pituitary hormones. This is the one that goes through systemic circulation and affects target tissues. So it's gonna act throughout the body, stimulate the release of insulin-like growth factor. And these are gonna to act together, growth hormone and IGF-1 to cause the growth of tissues. So we get bigger. We'll go over a few more hormone cascades later on in the next part, but before we move there, do we have any questions? Go through these and then we move on. So now I want to go through a couple of different things that the hypothalamus helps regulate so we get some idea of how it works. Uh, in most cases, we're going to see negative feedback loops. There are uh, a couple examples of positive feedback loops. You see these whenever you want a change to occur. Negative feedback loops are there to prevent changes. Uh, probably the best known function of the hypothalamus and pituitary would be the stress response. HPA axis. Hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenaline. So we've gone over this already. So we got our we got our cascade. So the um, parvocellular neurons in the paraventricular nucleus, these are going to release hormone into the portal capillary vasculature up here at the median eminence. The reason we do it at the median eminence is because that's where the blood vessels are and that's where the blood vessels have a leaky blood-brain barrier. That hormone being corticotropin releasing hormone, it's a hormone that causes the release of corticotropins like adrenal corticotropin hormone. So the corticotropes down there in the anterior pituitary change one hormone into another. This hormone, ACTH, is going to circulate throughout the body. It's going to encounter the adrenal cortex. Those are then going to release glucocorticoids, as well as epinephrine, norepinephrine, and stimulate a stress response. Those glucocorticoids are going to act throughout the body. Uh, part of that body, of course, includes the brain. We are going to have negative feedback here at the level of the hypothalamus and the pituitary to prevent the release of our corticotropin releasing hormone and ACTH. So this is going to turn itself back off. There's our negative feedback. So that we don't have a prolonged stress response. We have a brief stress response. Hopefully we don't prolong it because there are other areas that these stress hormones act on. Like the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a fairly important structure in terms of memory. Um, if you were to lose your hippocampus, you wouldn't form any more new memories, at least episodic memories. So you'd be trapped in time, every moment would feel like you're just now waking up. Apparently it's like living death. But I don't want to be too cheery. Uh, what your stress hormones are going to do is prevent neurogenesis, or the birth of new neurons in the hippocampus. This is one of the few areas where we make new neurons. This is probably important for memory function, I don't really know. But that's the idea, uh, because typically whenever you have impaired memory, you have impaired neurogenesis and vice versa. So there's an association. When we look at the number of newborn neurons in terms of million cells per square micron, whenever you count in a brain slice here, what they do is label neurons with neuron-specific enolase, so they appear kind of dark brown and they look for newborn neurons by bathing them with a radioactive nucleotide and those neurons that become radioactive must have just made new DNA and therefore they're newborn neurons. So then they count their radioactive neurons and that tells them they're new neurons and when they, they plot this number relative to mice that were given a bolus of corticosterone, that's a glucocorticoid, that decreases. And whenever they cut out the adrenal cortex, so we're not releasing glucocorticoids, that number increases. So prolonged stress responses are going to impair neurogenesis and probably impair memory. Shaky relationship there. 
Certainly, glucocorticoids are going to act out in the periphery. Part of our stress response is going to be a change in cardiovascular function. Immediately, we get that increase in heart rate because of the release of epinephrine, norepinephrine, these act on beta adrenergic receptors, increased pacemaking, etc. Glucocorticoids are going to take a little bit longer to act, but they're going to offset that. So here's another round of negative feedback coming in. They're going to decrease the heart rate. Again, putting a stop to the stress response. This is just homeostasis in place here. Um, what we're looking at here are data from geese. Um, they put a heart rate monitor on them. And for some of them, they didn't do anything other than that. Uh, for others, they chased them around, caught them, <laughs> and gave them an injection. That's stressful, right? <laughs> Uh, that injection was either saline, that would be sham, or adrenal cortical tropic hormone. That hormone from the anterior pituitary that stimulates your stress response. Now, there's a few different box plots at all these different time points to just make this a little easier to look at. I put this blue dash line here to show you the control here. So they just put on a heart rate monitor, didn't chase them around or do anything. Yeah. It kind of fluctuates eh, somewhere around 120, 135 beats per minute. When they injected with ACTH to stimulate the stress response, you see more pronounced increase early on, plus they chase them around. That makes sense. <laughs> Later on, there's a decrease. So here's homeostasis coming in. That immediate stress response causes an increase, and then we have this delayed response it causes a decrease in heart rate. Now the reason why these responses are so delayed is because of the mechanism of action of glucocorticoids. They're not going to act on a metabotropic receptor. They're going to act on a transcription factor. That's their receptor. They're going to affect gene expression. This takes a whole lot longer. The fastest way to affect cell function is with an ion channel. After that, you have your metabotropic receptors. Then you have your kinases that are going to cause post-translational modifications. And after that, gene expression. So we're using the slowest form here with glucocorticoids. So it makes sense that it would happen after epinephrine and epinephrine. A couple different things are going to go on. We're going to get some release of glucose. This is going to help fuel uh, our tissues because we are having a stress response. We need to respond to some stressor that requires energy. That makes good sense. Uh, we'll also have a decrease in immune function with prolonged uh, stress responses because of the expression of anti-inflammatory genes. So whenever we stimulate our glucocorticoid receptor, uh, these are hormones, of course, so they're freely going to cross into cells, act on their intracellular target, it then migrates to the nucleus, and expresses some genes. The genes in this case would be anti-inflammatories, so they're going to suppress immune function. This is why prolonged stress uh, can lead to illness or a viral outbreak or something like a cold sore. Uh, we do have some positive feedback loops. Um, and, and these are going to take place whenever we want some sort of change to occur. We're not trying to maintain status quo. We're trying to do something. Uh, and those would be the ejection of either milk or babies. Um, these are positive feedback loops because what initiates them uh, it is going to be promoted by the actual pathway. So let's walk through this. Both of these are going to be regulated by oxytocin. Uh, this is going to be directly released into peripheral blood supply by the magnocellular neurons, for the most part in the supraoptic nucleus. They'll be <coughs> oxytocin in the uh, peripheral Pituitary. So what stimulates the ejection of milk would be uh, suckling at the nipple. This will be sensed by primary afferents down there in the nipple. They'll stimulate the spinohypothalamic tract. That's one of those divisions of the anterolateral pathway. So kind of similar to the spinothalamic tract, but instead of being the thalamus, we have the hypothalamus. The target there would, of course, be the superoptic nucleus, those big neurons there that will release hormone, in this case, oxytocin 
directly into the peripheral blood supply. The tissue that it's going to encounter would be the lactiferous ducts down there in the breasts. This is going to stimulate milk letdown. That's going to stimulate more sucking. So we get an increase in sucking behavior because, hey, we got some milk. This is great. We'll stimulate our spinal hypothalamic tract. We'll stimulate oxytocin release. We'll stimulate milk letdown. So this will continue until the sucking stops, either because the milk is all gone or the baby's full. Uh, same thing is true for whenever we want to uh, let out a baby. Whenever we have pressure on the uterine wall, same thing. Stimulate your spinal hypothalamic tract. We get the release of oxytocin. Rather than acting in the breast, now we're acting in the uterus, causing contraction. When the uterus contracts, pressure increases. Further stimulating this pathway, we get additional oxytocin release, more contraction, and this continues until the baby is gone. And out there in the world, and screaming and happy and all that stuff. <laughs> positive feedback loops. Of course, there's nothing positive about that first night of having a kid. Uh, other than this, here's your, here's your positive part. <laughs> Most everything else that we're going to talk about, though, would be negative feedback. Hypothalamus you know, is all about homeostasis, maintains status quo. Are you thirsty? Take a drink. Are you hungry? Have a bite. Um, so sensing thirst is accomplished by just monitoring salt content in the blood. How salty is your blood? That's what's going to determine how, how thirsty you are. Uh, when water levels drop, then the concentration of solutes increases as a result. One of those solutes would be sodium in this case. We can sense this in areas called the circumventricular organs. And there's a couple of them that are going to play an important role in regulating thirst. The subfornical organ is probably fairly important, as well as the vascular organ of lamina terminalis. There are other circumventricular organs. So these are areas that circumvent uh, the blood-brain barrier because they have some uh, perforated capillaries. Uh, one area that's kind of nifty to know about would be the area postrema. This is a, a circumventricular organ in the medulla that causes us to vomit whenever we have toxins in our blood. So if we eat some tainted food, this leaky blood-brain barrier allows neurons in the medulla to pick that up and that stimulates emission. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about intake here, uh, namely intake of water. So these leaky blood-brain barriers here allow the neurons to pick up the amount of salt that's there. The simplest way to pick up salt is just to use sodium channels. So neurons here have sodium channels that are going to be of course, stimulated by an increase in extracellular sodium. It's going to increase the diffusive force for sodium in case you're getting <coughs> salty. And that application of sodium causes an increase in their firing rate, as we can clearly see here. So here we're looking at um, action potentials in certain particular organ neurons whenever they're applying sodium lactate or lactic acid. Both have lactate in them. One is the acid, so it has a proton. The other is the base, which has sodium for the positive charge. In other words, sodium not sodium. The reason they use lactate is because if you use sodium chloride, for example, well, you're introducing chloride as well. We don't want to look at the influence of other ions, so they use sodium lactate in this case. So the appropriate control there would be lactic acid. Anyway, apply sodium, see an increase in firing rate. That makes sense. If your blood is saltier, these get activated. There's a couple different nuclei that are going to play a role here. Your medial free object nucleus is going to project up to the cortex. Remember, we have reciprocal connections with those higher structures. The cortex communicates to the hypothalamus to say, what are we planning? The hypothalamus can communicate back to let us know, in this case, we're thirsty. So this gives us the sensation of thirst. Uh, there's a couple things we can do about that. Go bring in some new water or recycle the water you already have. The least gross way of doing that is to pick it up in the kidneys. So we're going to stimulate absorption of water in the kidneys. So here's where our supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei come in. They're going to release antidiuretic hormone, also called vasopressin. It has several other names as well. Vasopressin is going to bind to vasopressin receptors. 
you guessed it, uh, down there in the kidneys, in the collecting ducts. These are GS coupled. We know what that means, yes? Of course, good. What does that mean? Yes, increase cyclic AMP levels. You should know that. You can also just look at the slide. That's okay, too. We increase cyclic AMP levels. Cyclic AMP is going to stimulate protein kinase A, and it's going to do two things for us, both of which involve increasing aquaporin levels. Yeah? Aquaporins, exactly what they sound like. Water holes. <laughs> These are not ion channels, they're water channels. Uh, so again, the, uh, the membrane of cells has that hydrophobic core, water doesn't move through, ions don't move through, so if you want to collect water, you need aquaporins. So these are going to be channels for water. Only water moves through them. So the way that we collect more water is to insert more water holes, more aquaporins into the collecting ducts. We do that in the short term by just phosphorylating them. Protein kinase A is a kinase. It's going to add phosphate groups. When it does that, it changes the structure, changes the function of different uh, proteins. One of the targets would be aquaporins. When they're phosphorylated by protein kinase A, they're no longer held in reserve within the cell. They <coughs> move to the surface and insert into the membrane. So now we're inserting aquaporins that were already there, just not at the surface, into the surface. So we have additional sites for water uptake. If we continue to have vasopressin release and we have prolonged activation of protein kinase A, clearly we're going to need <coughs> more protein. The way that we do that is through transcription. So protein kinase A will still act on CREB. Which lecture did we talk about that in? I should remember these. Anyway. Whatever I said in whatever lecture it was, it's still true. Protein kinase A is going to phosphorylate CREB. CREB is a transcription factor. It's going to cause the expression of some genes. The genes that we care about in this case would be aquaporin. So we make more aquaporin. Here it is in a cartoon. Here it is in real life. So down here, we're looking at aquaporin levels after the application of antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. Here's three different samples without. Here's three different samples with vasopressin. On the left here, we're looking at a Western blot. All the dark little blobs are just showing you aquaporins. They come in different weights uh, because of post-translational modifications. Don't worry about that. Just look at how black each column is. The blacker it is, the more aquaporin there is. I think a better way to visualize that is with immunofluorescence. The green there is showing you aquaporin. On the left, no vasopressin. On the right, vasopressin for 24 hours. A lot more aquaporins as a result. These mouse collecting duct cells are going to be much better equipped to pick up water. So when we're thirsty, our medial preoptic nucleus gives us the impression we're thirsty. Our cortex will then coordinate some behaviors to go seek out water. In case there's none available, we can just pick it up. So there's a couple other nuclei that will release vasopressin that then causes our kidneys to seek out and pick up more water by inserting additional aquaporins into the membrane there. Feeding behaviors are also going to be regulated by the hypothalamus. So a couple nuclei to think about here. Uh, the central one is going to be the arcuate one. It's going to have a couple different targets that we'll get into in just a moment. The apostat, which is uh, what they're calling essentially the appetite thermostat. So when you set the thermostat, it's going to be, it's going to hold the temperature at a given level. So it's going to hold your appetite at a given level, depending on the input from the lateral or ventromedial hypothalamus. <coughs> One of those is going to be our feeding center. So the lateral hypothalamus is going to promote feeding behaviors while the ventral medial hypothalamus is our satiety center that says we're full. When you lesion these, you get the expected response. If you lesion the lateral hypothalamus, no more eating. If you lesion the ventral medial hypothalamus, they don't feel full. 
additional eating. Uh, we'll have a look at that one because it's kind of cute. Here we have our little pot belly dog. Here we can see the amount of food intake in 12 different dogs before and after they lesion the ventral medial hypothalamus. Notice the difference in food intake. We're a little under a kilogram, and we're somewhere over two kilograms, so it more than doubled. Not surprisingly, they got a little belly. Isn't it kind of cute? Drags on the floor. <laughs> Much better than looking at emaciated, angry animals, and that's what you get when you lesion the lateral hypothalamus. They don't want to eat, they're also very irritable. Now we have um, input to our hypothalamus that tells us the current state of hunger as well. So this is your kind of set point. How much do you want to eat? It depends on the input from the uh, lateral and ventromedial regions of the hypothalamus. Depending on whether or not we have a full or empty stomach, that's going to determine whether or not we want to go eat. When our stomach is empty, the hormone ghrelin is released, and ghrelin is going to stimulate the arcuate, kind of like what the lateral hypothalamus does. This hormone is going to act on GS-coupled receptors, stimulate protein kinase A, which increases the uh, activity of voltage-gated calcium channels. So, more calcium in our arcuate neurons. And we can see that right up here. And we know that it involves protein kinase A because if you add a protein kinase A inhibitor, the application of ghrelin doesn't cause this increase in calcium. So calcium is on the y-axis in all of these plots, as you can see. Time is over here. And they're applying ghrelin with a couple different protein kinase C inhibitors, which you might expect because protein kinase C is activated by calcium. Anyway, it doesn't do anything. You still get an increase in calcium following ghrelin application. You only block it when you block protein kinase A. Here they use something that's similar to this inhibitor that doesn't actually inhibit protein kinase A, but it's structurally similar. Anyway, function is not the same, so it, it doesn't block it. Here's what matters. Here's why we think it. So when you have an empty stomach, a couple things are going on. Uh, we're going to be stimulating the amygdala. Remember, we have reciprocal connections with those higher structures. So the amygdala tells us about our emotion. The hypothalamus can also influence our emotion. So if we're sensing an empty stomach, obviously that makes us really happy. <coughs> of course not. We get hangry, and the reason that we're hangry is because of activation of the amygdala. We don't like it. This is not good. I want to do something about this. I'm hungry. The sensation of hunger arises whenever we eventually stimulate the cortex. This is where the magic happens. This is where we get that perception, I'm hungry. You might not realize it, but you're also irritable. <laughs> Once we fill up our stomach, no more ghrelin, no more stimulation of the arcuate, we don't stimulate the amygdala, we're not angry and hungry anymore. Now what's happening, this inhibition of the ventral tegmental area, so dopamine neurons, dopamine, we should be thinking happiness. Um, normally these are going to be inhibited whenever our arcuate's active. But it's not anymore, so what we're going to do is disinhibit the VTA. So this inhibition is lost. The VTA can provide dopaminergic input to the emotional centers of the limbic system, like the nucleus accumbens, and this tells us, hey, I like food. This is good. I should eat more of this. This is especially true when you eat fatty foods, because fatty foods are going to help promote the release of dopamine. And that's why things like cheesecake are so good. Thank you. I think we all agree on that. Yeah. Maybe you don't like it, that's okay. Yeah, ice cream. Yeah, ice cream, exactly. Also good. It's hard to find a fatty food that I don't like. Now, um, the, the counter hormone to ghrelin would be leptin. Leptin uh, concentrations are a lot more constant. Um, ghrelin is going to fluctuate throughout the day as our, as our stomach empties and fills. There's going to be a release or not of ghrelin. Leptin will be a little more constant because this is released from adipose tissue. You can get little spikes here and there, uh, but for the most part, it's 
fairly level and dependent upon the amount of adipose tissue. So, in case times are good, we find a whole bunch of cheesecake, scarf it down, store some energy, well then we probably don't need to seek as much food. That's the idea anyway. We can escape this, uh, of course, we can apparently become leptin uh, insensitive. But as we accumulate adipose tissue, they will release leptin. Leptin is going to inhibit the argument so we don't exhibit as many feeding behaviors. We're not as, as uh, likely to go seek out food when we have the accumulation of adipose tissue. And that's because leptin is going to have a completely different effect in the arcuate. It's going to activate potassium channels. This is going to bring arcuate neurons, of course, closer to potassium's reversal. And that's exactly what we see here. Here's a hypothalamic neuron in the arcuate spiking away. The animal has been fasting. It's hungry. The arcuate's firing because it's hungry. They apply leptin. Not spiking. Yeah, not hungry. Leptin is going to be negative feedback. If you overeat, have fatty tissue accumulated, don't eat as much until this drops down and leptin drops down to disinhibit. This is not a perfect system, of course. We can't escape it. <coughs> but here's the idea. We have a set point for what we would like to eat. That's going to provide sort of tonic excitation or inhibition of the arcuate. And then we have our peripheral input to tell us how well are we actually regulating our hunger. Do we need to eat? Have we stored enough energy in our body? Maybe we shouldn't eat for a bit. The arcuate is then going to affect our behavior. When it's active, it'll stimulate the amygdala and prefrontal cortex to help promote feeding behaviors. It will inhibit the BTA, so we're, again, not feeling happy. Once it's inhibited because we've become full, ghrelin levels have dropped. Once our stomach is filled up, no more ghrelin stimulating it. It doesn't excite the amygdala. It doesn't inhibit the BTA. Our nucleus accumbens receives dopaminergic input, and we feel pretty good about it. So we'll be eating a few times throughout the day. We'll be drinking a few times throughout the day. The hypothalamus does a lot of things throughout the day for us. One of those things would be creating our perception of the day. What's our subjective day? What's our subjective night? That's based on activity in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The suprachiasmatic nucleus is that nucleus just above the optic chiasm. And it's pretty nifty. Even in the absence of light, it exhibits these circadian fluctuations in activity. So if you isolate these cells and put them in an incubator, close the door, keep the lights off, you'll see <coughs> spikes of activity followed by a period of inactivity. And it's pretty close to 24 hours. You'll see the same thing for hormone release. That's what we're seeing over here. So we're looking at the data from a few different rats. Uh, keep in mind, rats are nocturnal. So the dark bars here be when they're active and the light bars when they're sleeping. So flip this for humans. Vasopressin levels. Does vasopressin do anything for us? Have we heard of this before? Fantastic. Yes. Water absorption, things like that. You ever wonder why you uh, can go so long without urinating at night? You need to think a lot more about your life then. Um, well, here's why. We have these circadian fluctuations in vasopressin during the active period, low levels. When the rat is sleeping, notice in each case there's a spike in vasopressin. When the rat's active, it's low. It's awake. It can go around. It can drink from the little water bottle. But when it's sleeping, it needs to make use of the water that it has. It's not going to go out and seek new water. It's going to be recycling water more effectively at the kidneys because of this circadian spike in vasopressin. That'll allow it to, of course, sleep for a bit longer without having to get up, go to the, well, not the toilet, but, you know, eat it. For us, it's pretty nifty. We can sleep through the night because we're going to be reabsorbing a lot more water. Our bladders won't fill up and wake us up. 
And we see these day in, day out for all of the hormones from the hypothalamus. There's a circadian regulation. This leads to circadian regulation of our autonomic nervous system, where we'll have increases and decreases in sympathetic tone throughout the day. This doesn't happen, though, if you lesion the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So here's their subjective active period and their night, even though it's dark and light. Remember, they're nocturnal. In some cases, absolutely no change in vasopressin levels. In others, it's fairly chaotic. But you don't get these nice circadian spikes because they're internal clocks. <coughs> now, the way that this works is through uh, a couple different inhibitory loops of transcription factors. If you're interested, come by my office. We'll, we'll walk through it. Or you can just accept that this happens. There's circadian bursts and pauses, essentially, in the activity of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now, of course, our hypothalamus is not growing in an incubator. It's growing in our brain. It's connected, of course, to the retinal hypothalamic tract. So here's that optic chiasm. We're going to zoom in on the hypothalamus here and see how the suprachiasmatic nucleus affects the circuitry to create wakefulness and sleepiness. So, it all starts with the SCN, suprachiasmatic nucleus. During the day, typically it's bright. When it's bright, this is going to stimulate our suprachiasmatic nucleus because we're diurnal. We're active during light periods, and the reason we're active during light periods is because light stimulates our SCN. If it were the other way around, we'd be nocturnal. But we're not, so it isn't. During the day, our SCN is active because of the light. So in case you change time zones, you'll be applying light at different times to your SCN, and you'll change its circadian rhythm. That light stimulates the SCN along with those transcription factors that we're cycling. We're not going to talk about it in any detail. But during our day, the SCN is active, and it's inhibiting the subparaventricular zone that allows the dorsal medial hypothalamus to be active. There's normally the subparaventricular zone inhibits it. So we disinhibit the dorsal medial nucleus of the hypothalamus. That's the important first step. We allow this to be active. The dorsal medial nucleus of the hypothalamus is an important regulator of the next critical step, which would be the lateral hypothalamic area. It does two things to allow it to be active. One is to stimulate it directly, and the other is to disinhibit it. So it inhibits the ventrolateral preoptic area. This normally inhibits the lateral hypothalamic area, unless you inhibit it. By having these two different inputs here, <coughs> this allows us to have a cleaner switch between day and night. During the day when the SCN is active and disinhibiting the dorsal medial hypothalamus, we're both exciting and disinhibiting the lateral hypothalamic region. The next and final critical stop would be the tuberal mammillary nucleus down there in the hypothalamus. That's the source of your histaminergic neurons. So they're going to release histamine widely throughout the cortex, but only when they're stimulated by orexin, which is released from the lateral hypothalamic area. This is the same orexin that stimulates erections. Maybe that will help you remember it. Orexin is going to stimulate GQ-coupled receptors in the tuberal mammillary nucleus. That's going to excite our cortex, maybe other regions as well. That will make us awake. At nighttime, total opposite. So during our subjective night, the reason we get sleepy, activity in the SCN drops down. We no longer disinhibit the dorsal medial hypothalamus, so the subparaventricular zone inhibits it. Activity decreases here. This means we're not exciting the lateral hypothalamic area. We're not inhibiting the ventral lateral preoptic area, so that allows it to inhibit the lateral hypothalamic area. We don't release orexin, we don't stimulate the tuberal mammillary nucleus, we don't release histamine, we don't stimulate our cortex. And that's really all wakefulness is, cortical activity. I think this might come up again later, so you'll, you'll hear about the SCN. It's an important area to know because it regulates your day-to-day.
Do we have any questions? All right. Then let's talk about these, and that'll be the end of it.